Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 80 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. My guest today is Master Carlos Machado, but before we get to that, let's do our Jiu-Jitsu quote. And that is, My father was a naturalist and a very spiritual person who had a great desire to pass on his knowledge to others so that they could receive the benefits of Jiu-Jitsu as well. Growing up in this environment, I learned that jiu-jitsu is actually a method through which one strives for self-perfection. And that's from Master Carlos Gracie, Jr. Okay, on to the interview. My guest today is Master Carlos Machado, ninth degree coral belt and the oldest brother in the legendary Machado Brothers family. In the early 90s, he and his brothers, Hegan, John, Roger, and Jean-Jacques, formed Machado Jiu-Jitsu one of the main BJJ organizations in the Northern Hemisphere. Through the years, he's had a very interesting career in Jiu-Jitsu and has influenced the lives of thousands of students. In this episode, he discusses the early years of training with his brothers and cousins, living with Carlos Gracie and training with Carlos Gracie Jr., Holes and Carlson Gracie sharing the same building for their schools, the start of Gracie Baja, how his training philosophy has changed over the years, Chuck Norris's role in helping him get established in the U.S. and later in Texas, and assisting Chuck on the set of Walker, Texas Ranger. He also discusses key training principles, his view on why he and his brothers have been so successful, his upcoming seminar tour, and exciting social media projects he has going on. So I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy this interview. After the interview, stick around for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment, where I'll be reading an excerpt from Master Carlos's book. All right, without further ado, let's talk to Master Carlos now. Okay, I'm speaking with the legendary Master Carlos Machado. So welcome to the show, sir. Uh, thank you, Marty, for having me here. It's a pleasure to uh, hang out with you and your uh, audience and, and talk some good old things about jiu-jitsu, you know? Absolutely. That's awesome. Absolutely. It's a, certainly an honor to be uh, speaking with you. You're truly legendary in the world of jiu-jitsu, so uh, thank you for the opportunity. You're, you're welcome. So you've got a lot going on these days, uh, for sure, and we're going to talk about as much of that as possible. But before we get to it, let's just go back to the beginning. Take us back to how it got started for you. I know you grew up in Brazil. So what was it like for you growing up and, and what was the training like back then? Yeah, I was just talking about that the other day. You know, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, I guess you can do what we call smart training. You know, you do uh, a certain amount of physical training. You do you can do conditioning, stretching, recovery, uh, the knowledge of supplements, taking good supplements for your joints and all that stuff. And despite the fact we had the Gracie diet at the time, you know, I started when I was four. Uh, our, our thing was like we have a, a happy uh, sibling rivalry between me and my brothers and some of my cousins were my peers at the time that, you know, we always would keep each other on tab regarding you not know, missing classes, you know, because then if you have a, a, everybody training, you know, starting kind of at the same time and one person starts to slack, you know how it feels when you stop training and then you go back. 
and uh, all your training mates, you know, uh, who have the better of you because you're not as uh, up to date uh, with the training as you should. So uh, one of the motivations that we had from the start was just to stay with the herd, stay with the crowd and mm. make sure that we are doing all we could to stay a top notch. And, and plus, you know, the legendary name, you know, the Gracie name they are with it, you know, when they had tournaments and we started to compete, I competed as early as four years old. Wow. You know, uh, there was a certain degree of responsibility of, you know, you, you do all you can to win, you know, because everybody's winning next to you. You don't want to be the one, you know, uh, not doing, you know, what you can to keep up, you know, with the expectations. Sure. Uh, training wise, let's say 10 years and then when it became, you know, blue and higher, it was it was just like, a, you know, my routine was two sessions a day, at least, you know, and uh, be, becoming an assistant instructor in 1982 with my cousin Carlos Gracie Jr. Before Gracie Baja was created, uh, it was just like, a, you know, I was a immersion, total immersion. You know, you're pretty much on the mat all the time. We had mats at actually every home that we lived, in addition to. Uh, the academy that we would go work and train at. And also when we had vacations, like they say, going for holidays at the mountains in Teresopolis, which was a town a couple hours away from Rio. Uh, we always go down the weekend and we had friends of ours that had mats in their uh, houses and stuff. And then we always keep doing techniques, keep doing, you know, one of the things we did in Christmas time, I knew we knew everybody was just partying and New Year's Eve, you know, everybody just, Brazilians like to party, especially <laughs> when it's New Year's. Yeah. Uh, and we were just training, you know, and try, try to kind of get ahead of the, the, the crowd by just kind of, you know, let everybody party. And we, so kind of not trying to be too long on the answer. Uh, I would say I would train seven to eight hours a day wow. back in the old days. It's oh, yeah. just not far-fetched. It sounds like you're extremely focused. Everybody else is out partying, and you and you, your uh, family are, are highly focused on getting better and better at an early age. That's really great, very commendable. I can't imagine a better atmosphere to grow up in as far as jiu-jitsu. You know, you have that camaraderie, uh, the brothers and the cousins, but also healthy competition, you know, keeping mm -hmm. you on the right track and keeping you motivated. So awesome. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. And you trained at the uh, Gracie Academy in... Rio, and then later went down yep. to Copacabana, right, with uh, Holes? Okay, so uh, I, my, my jiu-jitsu journey, I believe uh, I, my first class was with late master Helio Gracie, uh, Uncle Helio Gracie. Uh, I, he used to have still uh, his place in downtown Rio. Uh, it was a building that had a huge suite. You know, they had all these mats there. They were one of the original... Uh, Gracie Academies uh, ever to exist in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, we used to go there and he would teach privates to me, Hori, and also taught me some privates and stuff. But because of the distance, it became more feasible for us after we grew a bit older to go to Copacabana where you would have Carlson Gracie and Halls Gracie sharing the same building. Mm -hmm. Imagine two academies on the same place. And, and the two academies, although they're brothers, uh, their teams compete against one another. So uh, there were some sort of rules that everybody abode by. For instance, the top floor was the bigger mat area, and then there was a, a lower floor that was the smaller mats. And uh, Hall's, Hall's group would uh, take turns occupying the bigger mat Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And Carlson's group would, would occupy the bigger mat area Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays. So all we need to do is go upstairs or go downstairs, and we'll cross with one another. And we're not allowed to watch each other's training because, you know, if you're training with Halls or if you're training with Carlson and you know you're going to compete against one another, at that time at least, right. they kind of try to keep things, you know, uh, you know, each one doing their training separately. But uh, the interesting thing is I trained with Carlson for a while, too. Carlson Gracie was one of my instructors. Hmm. And... Uh, and then uh, I phased in with uh, Holes. I was I was a, a, a yellow belt, I think, by the time I started training with Holes. And, uh, I mean, kids, yellow belt. Right. And, and then uh, un, until 1982, like uh, Carlos Gracie Jr. started to teach as well, being an assistant to Holes, one of the main assistants. 
Uh, Jacques Carré uh, used to train there, the head of Alliance. Uh, and uh, later on, I'll explain what happened if we have time. But uh, anyhow, he start, I started to kind of, I, I used to live with my uncle, Carlos Gracie, who was the dad of Carlos Gracie Jr. So he had a big mat area and a three-story house where he would start small group classes and some privates. So occasionally, I, I would just kind of participate in training there as well. And uh, so eventually we faced in training with Halls and Carlos Gracie Jr. And then 1982, Halls passed away, unfortunately, with the accident, yes. the hang gliding accident. And uh, from that point on, Carlos Gracie Jr. took over the Copacabana, you know, uh, uh, originally Gracie Academy in Copacabana that was under Halls. And uh, I think it was like a few years later, he moved to Baja and created the Gracie, the first Gracie Baja Academy out of, uh, you know, that neighborhood. And, and I, we went with with him, you know, and then that's kind of like how we went. And when I came to the U.S. in 1990, you know, I uh, me pretty much, you know, uh, I started to work. Uh, we decided not to work with the Gracie Academy after a while. So my brothers and I created our own brand, I guess, uh, the Machado mm-hmm. Jiu-Jitsu brand. And uh, we kind of became each other's, you know, uh, coaches because we didn't get, you know how it is when you are in the U.S. It's a big country and all the cousins travel everywhere. And then we're no longer in Brazil. In Brazil, you know, our, our instructor originally, Carlos Gracie Jr., was still living there for several years. So uh, so kind of that's how my, and nowadays, of course, despite training, any opportunity with anybody that, I, you know, I can learn from, uh, my students became actually my main uh, teachers mm, to, to a certain, very cool. certain degree, yeah. Very cool. Uh, Got to ask you, I, I read something that you were called uh, Soneca, yeah. means, which means sleepy, in your early days <laughs> because you like to take long naps between your training? Well, the, the nap is important. I think, uh, you know, your, your body has to have its rhythm, yes. you know, so I think it's a healthy thing. But the way we did, I think it had to do, too, the diet that we had which I still follow the, the food combining charts and everything, but we used to have consumed large amounts of uh, fruit juices. You know, like I would have a full jar of watermelon juice or a full jar of a, a acai uh, smoothie, you know, and those have a high content of sugar. So uh, once you have one of those, man, you 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 need a nap just to kind of, <laughs> it makes you sleepy too, in addition to all the, the energy training, that you yeah. spend with training. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure. And you also attended uh, law school back in Brazil. Yeah, I, I, between uh, 80, was that uh, 82 and 86? Yeah, we did go. I did go to the University of Rio de Janeiro. But uh, it's kind of hard to keep a suit in the hot weather in Rio. If I'm going <laughs> to sweat, I always joke about that. I might as well be sweating with a gi, yeah, not a suit. Great. Did yeah. you have aspirations at first of, of you know going that route, uh, either into law or politics or something? If so, when did that change and you decided to go full-time? Oh, uh, it was kind of like my dad was a judge from the high court in Rio de Janeiro. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he, he advised me saying, you know, you go to law school. I have all the connections already. You know, you, you wouldn't be hard for you to land a good job at a, a law office. Or if you want to create your own practice, there are different business, businesses like, uh, for instance, maritime law, which is a specialty law. Yeah, very profitable, you know, like uh, there were a lot of investments from England and Japan building docks and ships in Brazil. And, you know, if you broker a deal like that, like let's say if you sell a car, you can, you know, turn around the car and make a few thousand dollars. You turn around a ship, you make a few million dollars. You know what I'm saying? It's just like another scale. Right. So I had that kind of set up for me. But like I told you, you know, I was always inclined towards health. Mm-hmm. and uh, exercise and things like that. So it was hard for me to kind of detach. I would have detached myself altogether from jiu-jitsu, you know, going to live in Japan, learn Japanese. and Although, of course, you know, I guess you can learn martial arts in Japan as well. Even now, there are plenty of Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools. But uh, back then, it was not the case, you know. So it would have been pretty much a, a split in my martial arts career. So... That's very commendable because, you know, so many people take that safe path, that path they feel like is going to give them security and money and that kind of thing, prestige, but they don't listen to that internal compass, you know, what you really are led to do. 
it sounds like you walked away from one area or one life, but really followed what uh, what you were led to do, obviously. Yeah, I think there are different situations that happen. Some people do that earlier. Some others, they go a different route, and then they realize that's not what they want. Then they switch to whatever their calling is. Uh, I think, you know, each person has their own, I guess, path at a time. For me, the decision was not that difficult, you know, when it happened. Okay. All right. And you mentioned uh, when you came over. So tell us a little more about being, you know, in the initial wave of Brazilians coming over and being responsible for spreading jiu-jitsu, you know, dropping that pebble in the pond, so to speak, and setting that ripple effect in motion. What was it like back then? You know, I guess you can say that when history is happening, a lot of times some people have the vision ahead. You know, they kind of anticipate or have an idea where they want to head towards. But we had no clue. Like, we're in the midst of it. I think Horian probably had a better view of what he wanted to accomplish on a larger scale. When we came, we we were just kind of young and immature and, you know, just kind of taking it in as 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 it was happening. You know, and then uh, we never knew the magnitude in which jiu-jitsu would uh, expand and appeal to the crowd. You know, we had uh, in 1993, the first UFC, everybody wasn't, you know, with, with the expectations. Hoist, you know, jumped on board and fought and won those three events in a row. And all of a sudden, there was a big shakeup. Like, whoa, you know. And uh, But we, we, my brothers and I, we, we're kind of like a... How would I put, uh, you know, we, we had our ideas of, you know, we want to just build this thing and share with as many people as possible and reach out and make as many friends as we can and impact martial arts. You know, so we started that motto, leave your ego at the door. You know, so, I mean, of course, back in the old days, uh, the philosophy of showing jiu-jitsu was if somebody walks into your academy to find out about jiu-jitsu, you're going to have to roll the guy, tap the guy out a bunch of times, have a challenge match, whatever. Yeah. the situation was at the time to so that guy was all kind of there convinced oh man this thing man, works you know this is good you know and i guess that was the model for a while but then as more people got educated about it then we realized there was some application and practical knowledge that jiu-jitsu could offer to a lame person or to somebody from any style so people came with a more open-minded more open-minded you know so it was, it was not like a you know, you had to prove, you know, you just kind of, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how it works. Try it out. See how it feels. You know, how does it feel? Doesn't that feel good? Yeah, that feels good. And so it's kind of like we kind of molded towards that path. And I think we're able to reach so many people mm-hmm. uh, with that approach. But, of course, sometimes you have those guys that want to test you and, you know, and, and push you. And, you know, you have to aggress, get a bloody nose here and there. You know, that's part <laughs> of the game. Right, right. So first of all, I love the uh, I love the expression "leave your ego at the door." And I'm glad you guys you know came up with that. And how interesting you know it must have been to be back then and part of that prove it stage, if you will. I'm sure you know you never knew exactly what to expect when somebody was going to walk in and, and challenge you. So it had to be just very crazy time in some ways. Uh, but also like how you're kind of a cerebral person uh, with your jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. You see a bigger approach. You know, the prove it, mm-hmm. the prove it stage or the need to prove it is certainly real, was real, and, and it can be still if someone, you know, challenges you for sure. But that's certainly not the best way in, in all cases. Jiu-Jitsu is for everybody, I believe, and, you know, lots of different kind of people can come in and do Jiu-Jitsu, and I, I really feel like mm-hmm. you get that and, and spread that yeah. kind of message. Well, let's put it this way. I have a saying, Jiu-Jitsu, the idea of Jiu-Jitsu is to turn a person who is either average or below average into somebody above average. You know what I'm saying? Whatever average you are is going to get you above what you are. Nice. That's the whole idea. It's not to make a, a Superman become even more powerful. You know, no, not the case. There are a lot of guys that have different experience. They're super athletic. They have all these different attributes. And even those guys, you know, as they kind of get into the training, they realize that if they focus on the technique, they can make their strength a lot more powerful because they don't have to waste so much energy and they can use the energy with, with a, a purpose, you know? So uh, it's kind of like it goes in more ways than one. Uh, I think here, one of the the really changing factors for us was our connection and relationship with Chuck Norris. Mm. And, uh, you know, he facilitated for us to operate our first location 
in California in Tarzana. And he also later in the years, besides being a great advocate of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, we, for several years in a row, would attend his uh, event uh, that happens every July until today. In Vegas, the, they call the UFAF Convention, yes. United, United Fighting Arts Federation. I still remember, you know, what it means, the, the, the letters. And uh, Jiu-Jitsu became, from the start, Chuck Norris pushed Jiu-Jitsu. Once he got exposed to my cousins in Brazil in 1987, once we came to the first seminar ever uh, of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu at uh, his convention in 1988. And then when I came back with my brothers in the early 90s and got together with Chuck again, you know, uh, it has been uh, something that has evolved uh, so much. Like, for instance, uh, the reason, one of the reasons that I came to Texas was the invitation by Chuck Norris, mm. that he wanted one of the brothers, in particular me, because I was one of his main instructors, uh, to move so he could still have access to the jiu-jitsu training after he started his TV show, Walker, Texas Ranger. And, of course, he evolved from there because we traveled all over the world. We know so many people right now. If you want to see any celebrity, you can go to Higgins School, and uh, you're going to see one or two actors, um, you know, almost every day. They are pretty popular, you know, whether in motion picture or TV shows. You know, it has appealed to mainstream. So before you had Lethal Weapon, you know, with... Uh, um, Mel Gibson doing a triangle and Gary Bussey, and now you have all these different things going on. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's uh, common knowledge. We just had uh, one of the greatest directors in Hollywood uh, getting his black belt under one of our students and uh, great instructor Renato Magno, uh, David Mamet. Uh, oh, yeah. he, he's he's a Oscar winner, you know, with the movie English Patient. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he, he just got his black belt, uh, I think, a, a little more than uh, a week and a half ago. So it's just that's amazing. You know, so I, it's exciting. Is it he the one who did uh, Red Belt? Yeah, he yeah, also yeah. did Red Belt. Great movie. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was cool. Your brother John was in that movie. Did you help yeah, in, with that movie as well? No, no, man. John, okay. John was like uh, all in charge. He has great talent. Um, you know, he has the looks. You know, he has that samurai look you know and, <laughs> yeah, for sure strong as it can be and uh you know it was fun you know it was yeah. fun. i i didn't get to participate at all i just kind of uh followed up uh, with him kept it up uh, as he was doing it right but he was he was a great great deal yeah yeah, yeah. and you mentioned your brother hegan i was it's fortunate to be out at his school a couple of years ago and take a private with him so it's very nice much nice. an honor to meet him you have been involved in many films though um in one way or another, and, and I think recently, John Wick too. You had uh, mm -hmm. you and your brothers helped out with that. Sure. With, uh, Keanu Reeves. Um, sure. Let's go back to Chuck Norris for a moment, though. I, I, I'm a big Chuck Norris fan from way back, and um, <laughs> and so I definitely want to talk about him. I'm sure, okay. I'm sure you could talk about him for uh, you know for hours. But how did you originally meet him? Wait, by the way, I still remember the Vegas, the footage of that first seminar that he brought uh, you guys in and that was yeah, very yeah. cool but how did you originally meet him and, and just kind of how that how did okay. that develop a little bit all right when i was 16 years old i watched lone wolf mckay oh yeah you know, it was one of, one of his all-time classics you know and i was like 16 years old right so two years later uh i think i went uh or maybe three years later we you know it was 1988 we went to california to spend uh a couple of weeks at horian's uh, house it was the first time that Horan actually set up uh, the seminar, the, the first ever jiu-jitsu seminar at uh, uh, Chuck Norris's organization in Vegas. So we went, a group of uh, 12 of us, I think, you know, had Hickson, my cousin Helium Gracie, Hansel, Hoyce, Hoyler, Hoker, Horian, you know, so many people showed up, Helson. Nice. And uh, it was a blast, you know, like we were having the best summer ever. And then we went there, we did the seminar, everybody was super friendly. And then, uh, uh, you know, that, that was the first time I met him, but it was, I wouldn't say I met him because uh, it was so fast. I briefly talked to him. It was mainly, he was talking to Harry and everybody else. When I came back to the U.S. in 1990, uh, that was different. That's, uh, well, we had Richard Norton, who's a good friend of ours from Australia. Mm -hmm. He used to train karate and kickboxing with uh, Chuck Norris, do like private workouts at Chuck Norris's uh, residence in Tarzana, yeah. and we used to live in Redondo Beach at the time, which was about 35, 40 miles away, so it was kind of like a 45-minute drive. 
And Richard started to train jiu-jitsu with us. We used to teach him in our garage. We had a double car garage out of the house. We used to uh, live in Reno Beach. And, uh, you know, he started to tell Chuck, hey, man, you should check, check those guys out. You know, they go, you know, go do some training. Because Chuck was, uh, at that point, he was not doing jiu-jitsu for a while. He was busy and everything. He had uh, recently divorced. You know, there's kind of some stuff going on. Anyhow, make a long story short, he showed up one day, had a class with Higgin. Then Higgin went a few times to his house afterwards. And then uh, from that point on, he helped us open our school. And uh, he would come and train with us. Uh, and I started training him. And uh, he would travel sometimes. Uh, he brought, uh, you know, some friends of his uh, in the business to train. And uh, I try to remember the country singer, Travis. Uh, Randy Travis. Randy yeah. Travis. Randy Travis uh, showed up and he did a class with me, a couple classes. And apparently they had some video clip they had to do together in Hawaii. So Chuck flew me into Maui. You know, I was like uh, in kind of Pali Beach, you know, like amazing set, like first time ever in Maui. And then uh, we were doing jujitsu at the terrace of uh, Randy Travis's home, you know, and Chuck was doing some filming. It was really amazing uh, <laughs> cool. time there. You know, I was just kind of, and then after that, he took me to Texas a few times. He was doing uh, some movie, uh, side, Sidekicks, mm -hmm. uh, one of the that. movies that he did uh, with Joe Piscopo. Yeah. And I was there. Uh, he had a ranch. I was there for like uh, probably like a week or a week, week and a half, 10 days. It was really amazing. So, And then eventually he took me, uh, I think it was 1991, to uh, Israel. He was doing a movie called Hellbound. And I was supposed to be in one of the, you know, uh, I guess advisors for the grappling the scenes and stuff, but it ended up being a, a vacation. I had we had Benny Orquides over there, you know, uh, and it was it was amazing uh, experience. You know, I spent actually I think almost three months in Israel. It was a uh, it was like uh, unbelievable. Wow. And uh, make a long story short, uh, once we came back though, Chuck was already uh, set to move to Texas. So uh, in 1992. He moved to Texas. I still was in California until 1995. But in our conversations, you know, Chuck mentioned, you know, you, may, you come there. Dallas is a great place. Texas is a great place. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up with uh, parts on the show until you build your school, which which he did. You know, uh, I came to Texas in uh, October of 95. And the first job that I had was not teaching jiu-jitsu. Like for weeks, I was just working on the show, getting beat up by Chuck Norris. You know, uh, wearing different characters, you know, right. costumes and stuff. I was a gangbanger with tattoos and a bandana one time. Another awesome. time I was a lumberjack, you know, with the trousers and stuff. You know, it was kind of interesting to see the whole world. And I kind of liked it. I said, man, this sounds good. You you play fight. You don't get hurt, you know. Right, right. And you, and you get paid more than uh, if you're fighting for real. I, mean, I kind of like this job. <laughs> but, sure. you know, but of course, you know, the school started to grow. And eventually I had to uh, get my gym outside his studio. It used to be a his TV studio. So I outgrew the place. And then uh, from that point on, you know, Chuck was occasionally training with me. But then at one point in time, you know, with all his responsibilities, it was kind of like a, we would work out together doing more fitness stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, the martial arts, you know, and I know that eventually he had to do a hip surgery. And that kind of slowed him down a bit uh, with the recovery. You know, and he's still very active and works out there. That total gym thing is no joke. Yeah. He can do that thing, man, uh, with a blindfold. He is a master of that thing. And his sessions, you know, he can put you to the test, even now in his mid-70s. Uh, that's, you know? that's awesome. He's a great so, example of someone, yeah. you know, as they're getting older, just still living that vibrant lifestyle and being, you know, a great example. Uh, props to him and Richard Norton for, you know, already being well-established, uh, high-level karate practitioners, very successful, but having the open openness of mind, you know, to see the value of jujitsu and embrace that and really form yeah. that, you know, relationship with you guys. So that's really cool. Sure. So you really got to help out quite a bit on his show. I just watched a video yesterday. I was uh, researching for this, um, a nice clip, and I remember, I remember the episode when it was out years ago, where all of you guys, all the brothers, were on the show, and Chuck got yeah, the yeah. ring and uh, went one at a time with you guys and everything. It was very cool. Tell us about when you got choked out by Chuck. I believe it was accidentally. What what was that? All? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was a lumberjack, and uh, I had trousers and a collar shirt, 
and he kind of gets behind my back and gets me in a collar choke. And uh, at that time, the camera was right in front of me. And, you know, chokes with a collar doesn't take much for you to pass out if you keep the pressure long enough, even if it's not tight, you know. And I, I know because I've done this for so long and I had moments in my life in the past that I passed out, not many. Uh, but the thing with Chuck was uh, he was doing the choke. I'm looking at the camera and, and I'm thinking, I cannot say anything now because he's going to stop the clip. They're going to have to do another take. I don't want to be embarrassed here. So then I thought, well, if I pass out, that's what they want the scene, the scene to look like. So it's going to look even more real, you know. <laughs> but uh, so he, he kind of luckily, you know, he kind of let go. I was kind of like almost out. I was still kind of semi-conscious, you know, like at it. And then I kind of did some yoga breathing, just kind of get the blood back in. And I got up and I, and I said, Chuck, come here. Hey, man, you choked me out. Uh, next time you do, put on the collar, on the collarbone. Put the collar on the collarbone, not on the neck. You know, it looks like you're choking me, but the pressure's not on my neck. You know, and then he was like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. He was very, always very careful not to hurt his stuntman. You know, like uh, he was very cautious always, despite any major fight scene he'll never hit anybody hard or or have any issues he was very ge uh, generous in that regard awesome sounds like you guys have had a, a really great relationship uh, over those years let's change yeah, gears. For sure. let's change gears just a little sir and um just sure. want to ask you how would you describe your approach or your philosophy regarding jiu-jitsu and, and has it changed over the years yeah it has it has uh, i kind of now my approach is like minimal movement. You know, I want to get more things accomplished without having to move uh, much. You know, because uh, if you if you see the the way things go, if you have somebody younger than you that is in great shape, strong, high testosterone, the guy's pace normally may reflect his particular stage. You know, he can afford to push harder, go harder, and I'm not saying that I cannot push harder. But uh, the way I look at technique, if you do the technique properly, you could do that technique a hundred times, and at the end of the, the, the time, the last time, you're not tired. You know, the technique just flows into position, and the execution takes place. So uh, I try to make people pay. I try to make people pay with minimal motion. Uh, another thing I do, I try to connect my body to whatever part I'm targeting. Uh, this is this is an approach I use called keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. <laughs> All right? right. And uh, my cousin Hickson has his approach, which kind of gives a vision of the octopus. Uh, if somebody, if I grab an arm and I glue the arm to my chest, all of a sudden the arm doesn't belong to my opponent. It's part of my body because it's connected to me. And that's how I learn how to do better hoop escapes from the mount. I never tried to roll the guy over unless I had his forearm in contact to my chest because mm. it was a lot easier to steer him uh, compared to if I had a gap. And uh, yesterday, for instance, I was doing an arm bar where you do a trap uh, and you hold the guy's arm and you connect, the, uh, open your chest and connect the arm to, to your chest. And no matter what the guy tries to do, he can't pull the arm out. It's a physical physics principle, you know. Right. It's glued to you. And then from there, you crunch. When you crunch, you transfer the energy to the guy's joint. And the last thing, you tilt. When you tilt, that's when you apply the pressure to break the, the you know, to, to apply the leverage to mm -hmm. to force the joint for him to tap. Nice. You know, and uh, so things like that. And I focus a lot on scapes, a lot more on scapes than on submissions. Submission for me is the retaliation process. For instance, instead of trying to go after the guy, to tap the guy out, I'll give you an example. I don't go, ever go for a triangle. I go for a sweep. If the guy's off balance, then I try a triangle. I never go for a cross lapel choke when the guy's postured up. I fake a sweep. When he tries to, you know, keep his balance, I switch for the choke. So the deception factor, you know, you have to create entry points for your techniques to flow in uh, without having to fight through the guy's... Uh, how would I put uh, the guy's opposition? For instance, if you're on top on the side control, you know a lot of times you, you try to use your hands to uh, go for, let's say, an Americana, where you grab the collar to go for a choke, 
and this and that. You do the cutter choke, you know, people move around and try to wrap the arm. But, but they're all using the arms. I like to use my body weight. So I do something like, for instance, I, I land my chest on the guy's belly. And then from there, I climb to his chest and I use, use a motion like a windshield. Mm. When, I spread, when I spread my chest to the left, he opens his arm on his right side. Then I spread my weight like a windshield to the right. He opens his arms. And basically, for you to submit somebody, you have to separate the guy's limbs. I remember John Danaher from the Danaher squad was giving an explanation about that when his guys attack the legs uh, or any, any limb. They have to separate that limb first, you know, and, I, and then you isolate and, and control, and then you apply the pressure with the submission and the twist to make the position work. So that's kind of like the idea that I have. You know, I don't try to ever force through uh, a submission. I try to open my way into it. Once there's separation, then you can go for the trap. From the trap, you go for the crunch. From the crunch, you go for the twist. You know, so it's all very easy to remember. The other thing about the approach that I use is the terminology, because people are visual. If you try to explain, I see sometimes people watching these YouTube videos of guys sometimes explaining great technique, and the, it, it lasts like 10 minutes, and you could vir virtually forward, fast forward the thing for the last minute and skip the, the first nine minutes because they try to explain, break things down. People don't want to hear, they want to see, mm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and But when you're talking, either you teach a lot and overwhelm people, or you teach random things. One day you teach one thing, another day you teach something else. Every science, every martial art has to have a lesson plan. Uh, you have to have the techniques that you teach to the beginners, the white belt, you have to face that uh, for the blue belt, purple belt and higher. So I have a, a website platform that passes on all the lesson plans to the instructors. So it becomes kind of like turnkey and I, mean, I have YouTube channel platforms that support that. And I have a yearly, uh, twice a year meetings, 15 hours at a time, where you do hands-on training, uh, revisiting the curriculum and kind of showing principles like some of the things that we're talking about, teaching methodology and things like that. And uh, so, so it's kind of like a, on a jiu-jitsu scope, I'm appealing to my community, you know, and, and, and catering to them that way. But there's such a vast... Uh, you know, need uh, for several uh, instructors that sometimes have been reluctant to phase in a jiu-jitsu program at their school. And I think the problem is nowadays, if you don't offer jiu-jitsu and you have a karate or a taekwondo school uh, and your student grows uh, far enough in that, that martial art, at one point in time, he probably already knows about jiu-jitsu from all the, you know, uh, notoriety that jiu-jitsu has at this point in time. But you might feel inclined to go and expand their knowledge doing jiu-jitsu somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I feel, why, why do we have to do that when I can kind of phase in the program for the karate instructor so he can have a, a side class on jiu-jitsu? And a lot of karate schools actually make mandatory for their black belts to be equivalent blue belts in jiu-jitsu. They have to have the basic knowledge of jiu-jitsu in order to earn the karate black belt. You know, that's pretty cool. It's cool. The other thing the other thing is a lot of instructors feel that they are not because they are not yet a black belt in BJJ that they can't teach jiu-jitsu. I said, I had a, a student of mine who was uh, then a purple belt and he had a class and there was a black belt in town that was just across the street from him and when they had tournaments, my purple belt instructor didn't compete directly against the black belt instructor. But he had students of his that follow the syllabus, follow the structure. When you put the two to compete, the students from the purple belt were defeating the students from the black belt. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? You know, structure makes a difference. Certainly. You know, it produces better quality students. And uh, so that's the whole deal, you know, with the uh, affiliation is to get you know, and uh, how many affiliations you have that have three brains that can work at the same time and have 200 years plus worth of experience on the mat between me, John, and Roger, you know, uh, my brothers. So uh, so that's the thing. I, I have a problem. I can brainstorm with John. I can brainstorm with Roger. Even Higgins and John, despite the fact they have independent organizations, 
they still land their brands if we ever need. I always joke with my students, if you present a question that I can't solve, I'm calling Higgin. You know, I just I use Higgin because Higgin is the biggest. So maybe it's more intimidating. You know, but that's, that's the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? You need uh, structure and you need to let people know they can. You know, and that has been a great thing. So we, we're we spreading fast. We have Absolutely. several new members uh, joining. And uh, I guess other than that, I have some events that are taking place. Uh, I have one event. This is kind of short notice for you this weekend. So uh, it's near Austin. Uh, I'm, I might send you the link, but I'm not, I'm not sure if your podcast will be ready before then. But uh, October, I have a, a route between uh, Raleigh, Virginia, Tennessee, and Chattanooga. I'm, I'm going to be doing uh, uh, a little mini tour seminar. And uh, I'll send you that link as well. So for the folks that are listening to me, if you want to kind of get hands-on with some of the concepts that you heard about, mm-hmm. uh, the, the breathing method that I'm going to be sharing as well. Uh, and by then I'll have my new publication already in place. Uh, I'll be in Raleigh on the 12th of October, uh, in Virginia on the 13th, uh, in Cookville, Tennessee on the 14th, and in Chattanooga, Tennessee on the 15th. And uh, it's kind of, kind of like that's what's cooking right now at the moment. Well, it's exciting. You certainly have a lot going on and platforms to reach the masses. Uh, I, I know you were quoted as saying, I'm not here to teach martial arts, but to change people's lives. And you're certainly demonstrating that uh, on and off the mat, but far beyond the mat yeah. and into people's lives, you are making a, a profound difference. So I certainly yeah. commend you on that. One last question. You and your brothers have been very successful in a variety of ways course in the competition arena as instructors and in, in the entertainment world uh, with your appearances in tv shows and, and film you guys have also graced the covers of countless martial arts magazines as well as producing your instructional dvds and books tv documentaries even comic books and that was something i didn't know uh, that was interesting what do you attribute your success to and what's made you and your brothers so successful well uh, i think there has to be a purpose behind anything and i think uh you have to start with the endings in mind okay so for me is how can i reach as many people as possible and impact them the most you know with whatever it is that i I want to accomplish and uh one i want women to be empowered so we're starting a self-defense program exclusively for women the principles are there I have some projects going on in cooperation with other brands about some uh, massive uh, tools to aid martial arts across the board, primarily to uh, striking arts like karate, taekwondo, kickboxing, and and the Chinese martial arts to kind of give them some options with their jiu-jitsu training. I have, uh, you know, but the platform social media gives you uh, amazing tools, uh, and I feel that... uh, it's based on results, you know, like uh, if somebody walks into your, your academy or if the guy has an experience in a seminar or buys a product that makes a difference in their lives, this is what I want to hear. I'm not seeking fame. My brothers, we don't worry about fame. Like he can, he doesn't have, never asks for pictures with all the celebrities. Uh, I, the first time I had a picture of Chuck Norris, he's the one that, that suggested it. You know, we, we are there for more than just the glamour. You know, and I think people feel that, you know what I'm saying? Even then, even now when I go to a seminar, you know, a lot of times I can go to a place and people think, oh, he's a coral belt. He's a, one of the Machado brothers and treats you with reverence. I, I'm very thankful and honored with that uh, treatment, but I'm there for them. It's not that they are there for me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And when, it's, when I finish the seminar... They don't have to ask for pictures. I say, come here, guys. Let's take a picture together. Or if you guys want a picture, come here. You know, it's it's like I'm no more than anybody because I know more jujitsu than many. You know, I, I, I'm just a person. And I'll treat everybody the same with the same respect. And I think this opens the door for you to uh, reach out to a lot more people. And that boils down to that, leave your ego at the door. Now, when you talk about success and accomplishment and this and that, the only thing I can tell you is uh, we even, even scratched the surface. You know, nowadays the possibilities are so much greater that uh, 
the, the sky's the limit and beyond. For sure. Well, you've definitely made a major difference and impact, and you continue to do so. And I'm excited to see what the the future holds for you as well, and how you'll be able to bring even more to uh, people's lives. So, I want to thank you uh, very, very much. It's been a, an absolute honor speaking with you, and I appreciate you allowing us and my listeners to uh, get to know you a little better, sir. All right. So, if you want to just uh, for a second, let them know uh, they can always have access to my Facebook Live. Uh, on my fan page, uh, Carlos Machado fan page. Uh, I, I need more likes because of my brother beating me here, and I think I'm better looking than all of them. So, <laughs> uh, the other thing here is uh, my Instagram. What's my Instagram? Uh, uh, at one Carlos Machado one. Uh, I do a lot of Facebook live and Instagram live, and I have a, so I'm kind of working with both. Okay, and uh, there's one more thing that I'm forgetting here. I started a closed Facebook uh, group called Jiu-Jitsu Hacker, and this is it's just for anybody. Um, it's a subscription-based. Uh, you pay $1 down, and for 30 days, you can watch all the different clips that I put there a couple of times a week. Uh, those are hacks, like th- things like, for instance, how can I break the grip of a big guy when I'm doing an armbar? So you kind of you got to get a situation that you need a hack to solve, and I'll give you a simple one, Okay. And uh, so basically, if you like what you see, it's a month-to-month deal. You pay $19.99 a month after the 30 days. can be canceled anytime. And uh, for any of the folks out there, if you feel that something that appeals to you, you can send a request to Jiu-Jitsu Hacker Unlimited. It's a closed group on Facebook. And from that point on, I'll send you a link and we can go from there. All right? Fantastic. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time and your knowledge and your insight and, again, letting us get to know more about you and uh, certainly wish you a long, healthy, and happy life. Take care, Marty. It was a pleasure talking to you. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Really enjoyed that interview with Mr. Carlos Machado. What a very interesting person he is. Up now is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Okay, time for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Today I'm going to read an excerpt from Master Carlos's book, and this is on achievement. Clearly, the indomitable spirit of man has to express the potential that lies within. Our creativity, gifts, and intellectual assets urge us to find channels to fulfill our incredible powers. Man is an achiever by nature, a source of strength with undeniable possibilities. There are common traits for an achiever. An achiever is a doer, one who makes it happen, who completes, ends, performs, executes, gets it done, carries it to completion, and goes all the way. In order to awaken this amazing potential, we learn from the start that it will not be easy. Often an achiever is not the brightest, the smartest, or the strongest. The achiever is one who sees where he is going and never stops until he gets there. What he may lack in one skill, he will make up for with another. An achiever's ultimate goal is to fulfill what he believes he is destined to do, regardless of how big or small that goal might be. So, great words from his book and... I think we all have the ability to be an achiever. And even though life isn't all about achieving things, achieving things is a worthwhile endeavor. And it gives us a sense of accomplishment and confidence when we're able to achieve things in our lives. When we're able to make goals, work towards that, and achieve things. Achieve greatness. So going through your day, your week, your month, I encourage you to keep this attitude of the achiever in mind. What do you want to achieve? What are you willing to do and to give up to achieve this? What changes will you need to make today to become an achiever? I believe you're destined for great things. 
And I think you're a cause set in motion. And I believe if you take time, get clear on your goals, get clear on what you want to achieve, make a commitment, you can do great things. So go out today and take on the world. Accomplish great things. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. I appreciate all feedback. So if you have feedback, please don't hesitate to give it. If you have ideas for the show or for guests, please let me know about those. You can leave feedback on the website at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. You can also leave feedback on iTunes. And while you're there, make sure to rate the show. It helps us with our standing in iTunes. If you haven't liked us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, please go ahead and do that. And don't forget to share the episodes on your Facebook and social media. Again, thanks again for listening. And until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.